a man goes to the doctor uh, with a bad foot. It's swollen and painful, and he doesn't know what to do. So he's in the examination room. He's on that exam table, and the doctor makes his examination. And the doctor goes over to a cabinet and gets out an enormous pill. I mean, this thing's an inch across, and gives it to the guy and says, here, hold this. I'll get you some water. Well, this guy's half panicked, thinking, oh, my gosh, this pill is huge, but he also wants to get some medicine in him to fix this foot of his. Well, the doctor's not coming back. What's taking so long? The guy's losing patience. Uh, a little time longer, the doctor still isn't back. He knows he needs to be patient, but he's losing patience. Finally, he's had enough. He lost his patience. He gets up and hobbles into the hallway, finds a drinking fountain, somehow downs this enormous pill, washes it down with as much water as he can, hobbles back into the exam room, sits on the table. Finally, the doctor comes back in with a bucket of warm water and says, as soon as we dissolve that tablet, let's soak this foot for about 20 minutes. Patience. If I asked 100 people if they wanted more patience, I bet 100 would say, yeah. We're wrapping up this seven-week sermon series in the book of James today, and we certainly could have spent a lot more time looking at this book. The book of James, as we found out, is rich, it's challenging, it's surprising, it's difficult, it's practical. On week one, we learned that there are actually blessings in our problems. Then we learned about temptation and dealing with it. We learned about the sin of playing favorites about using our words to honor God and to bless others. We learned about wisdom and relationships. And then last week, Pastor Zardi preached on avoiding arguments. Um, we're turning the corner here last weekend in James chapter 5. We're learning about patience. So what does it mean to be patient? First of all, let's kind of define it this way. Patience is the capacity to tolerate challenges or delays without getting upset. Saying it another way, it's having peace in the obstruction, whatever that obstruction is, whatever it is that keeps me from getting where I want to be, either geographically or otherwise, it, having peace in that. Author Tim Keller says, waiting on God is to be busy in service to God and to others. Then he says this, all in full acceptance of his timing and his wisdom. You heard Roy read from James 5 before. Let me reiterate just a couple of verses. That's what we'll be jumping off from today. James 5, 7 through 11, this author says, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the apostles who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You've heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. May God be honored in the reading of his holy word this morning. Let's come together in prayer. Father in heaven, grant us patience. We're so busy to get our way, to get to our destination, to cross things off of our lists. Help us to rest in you. Move us to, to desire you only and to only treasure your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray this morning, and together we all say, amen. So as we work our way through these passages in James 5, our first stop is here, that we under, ought to understand patience in light of the Lord's coming. James, in this passage at least, is talking very specifically about patience for Jesus to come again, so that's what we need to look into. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. It's a specific kind of patience, uh, patience in a particular circumstance. James isn't necessarily talking in this passage about waiting uh, for that job um, promotion or for that vacation that you've always wanted or to be healed of this illness that seems to be upon you or to, to meet the person you're supposed to marry. Now, everything we learn today will work into that kind of patience, but as James speaks about patience in light of the Lord's coming, that's where we need to be. So what does it mean to be patient in light of the Lord's coming? Well, hear me right, because I'm going to say something that might make you shift in your chair, but I want you to hear me correctly. It's a certain dissatisfaction with the world. Waiting for Jesus to come again necessarily means we have a certain dissatisfaction with the world, with our current existence. Perhaps we've become too satisfied or fulfilled with the world. Certainly there are blessings that we've been given. We should be thankful for them and enjoy them. But God designed us to be fully satisfied only with him, and that will only happen perfectly when Jesus comes again. C.S. Lewis, Christian author, writes in a book called Weight of Glory, and he uses older language. This book was written decades ago, so he makes reference to um, holidays by the sea and this type of thing. But I think we'll understand what he's going for. He writes, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition, 
when infinite joy is offered us. It's like the ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday by the sea. We are too easily pleased. Again, there's nothing wrong with enjoying life and the blessings that God gives, but we are like ignorant children, satisfied with making mud pies in the slum because we have no concept of what it's like to have a holiday by the sea, a great time. We don't really desire for Jesus to come again. We're just so satisfied with what's going on here. I've talked about this in the past, and uh, much to my um, embarrassment, perhaps. Um, I, I used to um, fast. I used to go without food regularly as a spiritual discipline. The Bible talks about that, and we can talk about that another time, perhaps. But one of the things I really wanted to learn, and the reason I'm embarrassed is because I don't do it anymore, and I can't remember why I stopped. Um, maybe because I was hungry. Um, one of the things uh, I wanted to learn is, like, well, like what am I going to learn from fasting? Discipline, okay, I'll spend more time and pray, this type of thing. But I've shared this with you before. The one thing that I really learned is the understanding, at least a better understanding of desire, of longing, of yearning. Man, when you go without food for a certain amount of time, you can't wait for whatever it is, that thing that you're going to allow yourself to break your fast with. That's what you think about, man, the first bite of watermelon I, or whatever, right? It, it used to keep me up at night. I couldn't sleep. Oh, tomorrow, tomorrow morning I get to have water. So that's what it's like. A certain yearning, a certain dissatisfaction with this existence, and a certain longing and desire for Jesus to come again when he will make things all right. The Lutheran Study Bible is a help to us here. The return of Jesus in glory shapes the Christian life. Now that's a strong statement. It shapes the Christian life. The return of Jesus in glory shapes the Christian life. Confidence in his return gives us perspective on how we ought to relate with one another in our sufferings, God promises to remain with us and restore us to himself. So as we think about the second coming of Jesus and all the detail that we got on that in the Bible, James is teaching us to trust God's timing, his patience. And then James kind of turns the corner and gives us the example of the farmer. God needs to talk to us simply, right, because of our thick skulls, at least mine. So he says, take a look at a farmer. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. James says that if you want to be patient, learn from the farmer. So what's it like to be a farmer? I don't really know. I'm not a farmer. You're probably not either. But I think we know some simple um, entry-level things about farmers, right? They are completely dependent on rainfall. At least in James' times they were, right? I mean, we have aqueducts now and sprinkler systems and stuff. But this is, the point is that the, the, the farmer was completely dependent on God for all the good that it would come. Be patient as God rolls things out in his timing. Because if we're honest, we can make plans. And for the most part, God allows us to fulfill those plans. But it's really just by his grace. I mean, the vacation you have planned coming up in a couple weeks, you'll probably get to do. But it's because God is letting you. He could certainly allow something to happen. The fact that your heart be just now, and just now, and just now. This is, these are all by God's common grace, by his command. So we are completely dependent, if we're honest with ourselves, on God. And that what it mean, that's what it means to be patient in God, to be completely dependent on him. The Bible speaks about children, Matthew 18, 2 through 4. Jesus called a child to them and placed the child among them. He said, truly I tell you, Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And we can certainly learn a lot from that passage. One of the things that strikes me um, strongly about that is the desperation and dependency that a child has for his or her mom and dad. The, the child will die if not for the parents. And that's you and me with God. We will die. We will cease to exist. We will lose our life. So complete dependency on God. The farmer also can keep busy during uh, waiting for a time of rain. I suppose uh, farmers don't just like plant the seed and then just hang around. I think they're busy doing things. As a matter of fact, I'm sure of it because I found this graphic uh, made by somebody who's probably not 30 years old. Um, what does a farmer do? Uh, they rake the dirt. They plant the seeds. They feed the pigs. They milk the cows, they water the plants and feed the sheep. They eat, you can't see that one. Uh, they collect eggs, they clean. They sleep, they pick the fruit, they pick the vegetables. They feed the cows hay, they drive the tractor, that sounds fun. They feed the chickens, they pick flowers. Pretty, pretty cute list. So farmers do things as they're being patient. They don't just kind of wait around for when it's going to rain. So what are we doing 
our farmers here at Royal Redeemer on a Sunday morning. What we're doing, first of all, everything to God's glory. We sift that through a filter. Is this going to glorify God? 1 Corinthians 10, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all things to the glory of God. So what can we do? What can we be up to, up to as we're waiting for things to happen in our lives? Well, we read God's word and we take it seriously when we read it. We partake in the Lord's Supper and benefit in all the ways that the Bible promises. Spend time in prayer for sure. We place other people above ourselves. We are generous with what we've been given. Proverbs 3, 9 mentions that. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. And whenever you get a list and a sermon of the things you ought to be doing and you know you're going to fall short, like I know I'm going to fall short, you turn to God in confession and repentance. And in the meantime, as you're waiting for whatever to happen to happen, you believe the promise, the promise that God is for us, that God loves us, that Jesus really was a man and really was the Son of God and really did die on a cross because of me and for your sin. And for those who confess and repent and believe, you are forgiven. We, we confessed a kind of a formal confession from the screens earlier in, in the worship time. And whenever we do a confession, we always hear the absolution, Follow the, following the instructions of John 20, that's a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by the virtue of my office, I forgive you your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. When you hear lists about being Christian and what you ought to do and you know you're going to fall short and do, you come to him in confession and repentance and he forgives. And when the harvest finally comes, the farmer celebrates the harvest. When it is that uh, whatever you've been praying for comes, whether it's God saying yes or God saying no, you rejoice. Exodus 23, 6. Celebrate the festival of harvest with the first fruits of the crops you sow in your field. Celebrate the festival of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in your crops from the field. Rejoice in God's goodness and his blessing in your life. Maybe make a list of things you're thankful for. Be grateful. Have a deep gratitude towards God's blessings in your life. We're learning from this book of James that he often takes a quick turn in what he's talking about, and it seems to me that he does that here. He says this. He says, as you wait, don't complain about each other. As you wait, don't complain about each other. James 5, 9, don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you'll be judged. The judge is standing at the door, grumbling. Christian author Scott Hubbard says this, we grumble when our faith in God's purposes falters. Unwilling to trust that God is crafting this disappointment for our good, we have eyes only for the painful now. That can move us to grumble. The Bible says don't grumble. Philippians 2.4, how much more plain can it be? Do all things without grumbling, without complaining, without murmuring, without leaning into your friend and saying, can you believe? How are you doing with that? I probably have a ways to go too. Um, do you grumble when you wake up with a cold? Did you grumble this morning when you found out that it was cold? <laughs> do you grumble when you have a, a tough day at work and the boss is actually giving you more than you're really supposed to be doing according to your job description? Do you grumble when you deal with difficult kids or when you see all the emails that you need to re read Monday morning when you finally get to work? Do you grumble on I-480 in traffic? Do you grumble that the Guardians did not make the postseason? Are you kidding? Do you grumble when the Browns turn out to be 2-2 two and two after four games? Mm. I suspect that a lot of us grumble, maybe without even knowing it. I suspect that some of us, that's our default of communication. We find a perverse, weird pleasure in it, so we lean in and complain about somebody. If you're the kind of person that really likes to hear rich application from a sermon, I think this is our one point to really help you with your patience. You came in this morning, maybe I'll learn something today with, to help me with my patience. I think this is it. Learning to be a non-grumbler will go far in helping you with your patience. If you're a grumbler, catch yourself. By God's grace and by the power of the Holy Spirit, stop. And I think that will go far in helping you with your patience. You want to be a more patient person? Catch yourself in your grumbling. Catch yourself in your complaining. Catch yourself in your murmuring. Well, next, James takes us to the example of the prophets and to specifically Job. To the example of the prophets and Job, James 5, 10, and 11. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering. Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You've heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and full of mercy. So let me just talk about a few of the, uh, uh, the um, 
prophets that came to mind this week for me. For, how about Daniel? Remember the book of Daniel? He was up against this uh, king named Darius or Darius. In the sixth chapter of Daniel, we read about this decree that Darius made that said, if you pray to the God of the Bible, you'll be in big trouble. Well, Elijah's not going to stop praying to the one true God, the God we know from the Bible, the God Jehovah. Well, that means a big deal because now he's going to be thrown into a lion's den. Daniel is patient to let God deliver him. He doesn't know. Maybe he wanted that decree not to be made, or maybe he wanted the sentencing not to happen, but it happened, and here he finds himself in a lion's den with hungry lions. Well, God delivers an angel of the Lord, of course, appears with Daniel in the den, and he is not harmed. Or the example of Elijah, Old Testament prophet Elijah, dealing with this evil king of Israel, Ahab. He was the seventh king of Israel, married to a wicked woman named Jezebel. And Ahab, Ahab had become a worshiper of a false god, Baal. And Elijah calls him out and says, Ahab, you shouldn't be worshiping a, a non-god. There's one god. Worship him only. Well, Ahab threatens Elijah, and Elijah is patient and allows God's plan to unfold and deliver him. And then the specific um, example that James gives of Job, you're familiar with the Old Testament book of Job, probably the, Old Test the oldest book in the Bible, probably written by Moses. True story of a man who really has everything. Strong faith in God, a huge family, a great family, wealth, health, suddenly loses all of it, loses all of it. For the most part, Job is patient. And in this case, God restores everything that was lost. So one more stop as we're kind of turning the corner on this sermon. Let me go back to the Lutheran Study Bible because I found so much richness this week in helping me. It reads this way, in our short-sighted, self-focused lives, we dwell on our own problems and try to deal with them ourselves. The quicker we get out of a mess, the better. But this is not God's perspective. He looks at the true goal, eternal life with him. Consequently, our sufferings can be borne with patience. He gives faith to sustain us through suffering and confidence to endure all things until he comes again. As usual, we've given you some next steps to consider this week to pray about. These are at the bottom of your worship folder. Think about these things. Let the return of Jesus be the event that you look forward to. Oh, I know, you've got a wedding next year, and that's going to be fun, and the kids are coming over. And they, Yes, enjoy that. Look forward to it. But be, let the second coming of Jesus be the event that we get excited about. As you're waiting, keep busy with things that bring glory to God. He may not deliver you out of this or that or whatever you're being patient about. In the meantime, don't waste this time. Live for him and glorify him. And then maybe one of uh, the one kind of concrete uh, application point from today. Um, while you're waiting, let non-grumbling, crazy words I'm making up, let non-grumbling develop your patience. See if that works. See if that when you stop grumbling, complaining, your patience increases. So usually at the end of the sermon, I pray for us, and then we're on our way. We're all going to pray together, if that's okay. I've got words on the screen. We're going to pray out loud together for patience. Would you pray this with me? Let's pray. Jesus, we are awaiting people who eagerly anticipate your return. Sit me down as I practice patience in all circumstances. Bring peace to my restlessness. Transform doubt into trust. And help me hear from you in this in-between. And when my waiting ends, fill me with satisfaction and point me toward the day when my faith will be shown true and you will make all things right and whole. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for taking the time to learn a little bit more about Royal Redeemer. We want you to be a part of our Royal Redeemer family here. May God richly bless you and guide you, and I truly look forward to seeing you soon.